Thank you for coming today. How is everybody? Good, good. We're on the, the downward side of the quarter, right? When you just sort of keep, keep sliding on through and get to the end. Thanks for coming today. This is our second to last Quick Bites of the year. I know many of you have been to other ones. Is, it, is this the first Quick Bites for anyone here? Oh, a few new people. That's great. That's great. So these happen, you know, every other week or so throughout the academic year. And uh, it's really a come to one, come to all type of thing. It's an introduction to some skill area or topic that you might be interested in learning more about later. Um, the last one is on June 2nd, and that's going to be John Boothroyd talking about uh, doing a presentation on speaking to expert audiences. It's a jam-packed, really content-rich presentation that John will be doing. So I encourage you to, to come to that if you're interested. And then we'll be setting our lineup for next year. So any suggestions you have are most welcome. Vanessa will send out the evaluations. And we always welcome feedback from graduate students, suggestions, ideas, people that you would love us to bring in. So please do that. So I'm Helen Doyle. I am the uh, Director of Educational Programs in VPGE. And I'm the person who runs this program. And I'm also the speaker today. So I'm just, I, that's my self-introduction. So that's it. Um, I have um, been thinking about mentoring a lot over the years, both from the time that I started out as an, as an undergraduate, started working in research labs, and had some wonderful experiences and some not so great experiences, and, and you know, then became a mentor myself. And so I've, I've been doing a lot of reading and thinking about this over the years. So I'm really happy to give you today a really compressed version of this mentoring and research workshop. This is really about skills to help you mentor other people. So welcome. So I want to first do a public service announcement from VPGE. The Stanford Graduate Summer Institute is happening in September, as it does every year. These are free, immersive, interdisciplinary courses open to all graduate students who will be enrolled next year. We've got a great lineup of 11 courses coming up. And uh, applications are still rolling in. The only one that we've closed so far is the um, Adventures in Design Thinking course. But there's going to be, there's a lot of courses here. So check this out if you're interested. And, uh, and then finally, I also want to refer you to the Quick Bytes Toolkit. This is a resource we have on our website uh, with this picture associated with it. And in here, you can find the slides and the handouts and other resources from this session, but also from all of our Quick Bytes sessions. So if you see a topic that you um, are interested in that you, you missed, uh, we had a great one a couple weeks ago on interviewing for jobs, you can go there and, and get the resources and things there. So check that out. OK. so. I want to think first about the term mentor. How many of you are currently mentoring a more junior colleague, an undergraduate or a more junior grad student? OK, great. And how many of you plan to be mentoring someone this summer? And how many of you are just here because you want to become a better mentor for future jobs that you might have or things that you might be doing? Great, OK, that's good. I would, I would um, put out there that probably all of you are going to be mentoring someone at some point in your career. If not here at Stanford, in the future, whether you stay in academia or not, whatever you do in your career, you're going to be mentoring people. You may be mentoring people outside of your actual career, outside of your job, too. So, so good for you for coming to this today. And again, I'm going to give you an introduction to some skills, but this is something that's another one of these lifelong learning things. You can always become a better mentor. And as I said at the beginning, I think a lot about that, how I can become a better mentor myself. But I want us to think first about this word, mentor. It's a nice little word. It kind of rolls off the tongue. But I want us to think about another word closely related, tormentor. Why is it that mentor and tormentor are so closely related? I'm really curious about that. It just, it just is so intriguing to me. What I want to hope to do today is to give you the skills to not be the tormentor, to be the mentor and not the tormentor. Okay, So that's where we're going to go today. And I think this is a good um, a mnemonic kind of memory device for you in the future. As you're having a bad day as a mentor, you're really frustrated, you're fed up with having to explain things, your mentee is not doing what you said, just remember this. You still don't want to be the tormentor, okay? Try to stay in that mentor phase. 
So today we're going to go through a lot of things, and I'm going to give you a chance to do some, some of your own planning and prep work and talk with each other. Um, this is the outline. We're going to go through some qualities, some benefits. We'll uh, get some, do some planning and thinking about how to get started. I'll get started on the right foot, making a plan, communicating effectively. We'll go through some case studies together, and then we'll do some wrap-up. So this is kind of where we're going to be going today. Are there any questions or other topics that you'd like me to, to add to this list as we go through? Okay. I want to say also that um, while, while this workshop is specifically about helping you become a better mentor for other people, so you become a better mentor, I think a lot of what you're going to learn here today may help you as a mentee, may help you manage up to your own mentor or advisor. And so keep that in mind, too. I know many of you maybe more in the tormentor um, stage right now with your own advisor and mentor. And so there are tools here that you can hopefully use to help you um, have a better relationship with your advisor and mentor. Okay, so first of all, let's think about the qualities of a good mentor. Think about a good mentor in your life, in your research career or in some other aspect of your life. Chat with your neighbor. What qualities did, did this mentor exhibit to you? What were the qualities of a good mentor? Okay, so just chat for a minute among yourselves and then we'll come back together. Introduce yourself to your neighbor first and then chat. Okay, so let's, uh, let's come back together real quick. Um, so let's share some of these qualities. What are some of the qualities? Like, first of all, I want to say I hope that each of you has had a good mentor before. I'm sorry I didn't preface that by saying just fake it if you imagine what a good mentor might be if you've never experienced that. But I hope that all of you have had good mentoring at some point in your life. It's really, really important. Um, so let's share some of these qualities. What are some of the qualities of a good mentor? Just, you can call it out, popcorn style. Yeah. Patience. Very good one. Yes. Regular feedback. Regular feedback, absolutely. And we talk about, when, in one of our, man our Management Matters workshop, we talk about feedback for change and feedback for continuation. So we don't use the terms positive and negative feedback, right? But feedback for change, it's an actionable thing, feedback for continuation. So keep those phrases in mind, too, as you're, as you're giving feedback. Yeah, something else? Relatability. Relatability? Say a little bit more about that. So relatability, that you can relate to each other. So think about a situation where you have a mentor or mentee that you don't actually have that much in common with, and you might not even really like the person that much. How are you going to deal with that? What was that? Respect. respect. Respect differences, absolutely. Maybe find something that you can relate to each other. There may be something deep inside there that you both like to cook paella or something, and, and that becomes the thing that you relate on, and that's OK. So taking the time to find out what you can relate on is good. What else? Uh, don't, make them feel bad for making don't make them feel bad for making mistakes. Does that, ha does that happen to you sometimes? You get feel bad for making mistakes here? Somebody, some of the students a couple years ago said, you know, you feel like you've come here and you should already know what you came here to learn. So keep that in mind that you're, you're teaching and they're learning. Yeah. Over here? Acceptability? Adaptability. Adaptability, right. Right. Adapting to different people's styles, adapting to different situations, adapting to circumstances that might happen in your research. You know, all the cells die. Well, you got to do something else. The computer crashes. Yeah. Right. So, so I would maybe rephrase that as, um, so being judged or being, uh, what did you say, being impatient can be a good thing. So I would rephrase that maybe as setting high expectations and, being, and having the mentee be accountable. Accountability is really important. You don't want to be abandoned. You don't want to abandon your mentee. So, so again, thinking about how that can be phrased in ways that are really positive. Impatience and urgency and excitement about your research, those are good things. Those are really good things. Those can be very motivating things. They can also be 
negative thing. So how do you how do you channel that kind of impatience and urgency in a positive way? What else? Other qualities? One more thing from over this side of the room. I know you guys were talking. What was that? Knowledgeable and smart, yeah. Knowing your stuff is really important. You've got a lot to teach, and you need to know your stuff. And, and hopefully you'll be challenged sometimes with questions that maybe push your own knowledge. And you had one more. Maybe I was going to say something similar. It seemed like a lot of the qualities so far were things you would look for in a friend. But I think someone with knowledge and expertise that they transfer to you is important as a mentor, but not important as a friend. OK, good. So, so knowledge and, and, um, and expertise are important. Great. OK. So you want to be inspiring, you want to share, you want to be welcoming. All of these are some of these, these softer qualities that are really important. Okay, so really quick group brainstorm. What are the benefits of mentoring? What are some of the benefits of mentoring for you and for your mentee? I want data. I want my research to progress. I got to graduate. That's one benefit. Hopefully you'll get some research progress out of it. So be, self be selfish here too because there's benefits for you as well, not just for the mentee. What else? Yeah. Labor. labor. <laughs> yes, labor. For some of those things that you don't want to do, you can get somebody else really excited about doing them. Remember the, uh, the Tom Sawyer painting the white picket fence? I think that analogy still work. It's so exciting to paint this fence. I, I can't let you do it because it's too exciting. But. Yeah. You learn, something better. you learn something better by teaching it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What else? This room, this side of the room is very quiet. I'm going to move over there a little bit. So, you guys, benefits of mentoring? Improving your communication skills. Improving your communication skills, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, some of the qualities that we just talked about, if you don't have those qualities yet, you can learn them, like patience, um, adaptability. Yeah. So it helps you understand mentoring relationships. It helps you manage up. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, there's, there's tangible and intangible benefits, and I think it's important to think about those things. There's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting some stuff. You want some great PowerPoint slides. You want a draft of an article. Um, you want something that maybe you're going to publish. Um, but there's also some, some intangible ones. It can help you get re-energized about your own research, help you learn some teaching skills, learn some management and communication skills. I think that the, when you think about mentoring and you think about the experience that the mentee is having and how valuable that can be, um, your charge, if you're mentoring, how many of you are mentoring undergraduates from Stanford? Okay, so quite a few of you. Um, your charge is not necessarily to make that person love research and go to graduate school. Okay, that's not necessarily what you should aspire to. That might be great if it happens. Um, I used to run a program in San Francisco where we had high school students from San Francisco and high school teachers do internships in research labs at UCSF in the summer. And one of our goals was to try to get these students interested in science and to get them to go to college and study science. But one of the students that I just loved from this program, this is about 20 years ago now, when we asked the students, what did you get out of your summer? And she said, I, I met people who really loved their job. And that was incredibly powerful to me, that that's what she got out of it. And I think that I'm pretty certain she didn't go into science. She was really interested in cooking and culinary school. But I hope that that experience of working with people who love their jobs got her to, was motivating to her. And so keep those intangible benefits in mind too. Sometimes it's helping build someone's confidence, helping them feel connected to the university in ways that they might not otherwise. Okay, so starting off on the right foot, really important. So many of us have seen the first interaction go bad quickly. And so um, Dara, Strauss, Albie, and I are now gonna do a role play for you. Um, I'm the harried senior graduate student who's just trying the heck to get out of here. And she's the lovely Stanford undergraduate who's coming to work with me. Um, so as we're talking, think about what you're hearing. Think about what you're seeing, how you're seeing us interact, but also think about how it makes you feel. Think about your gut. How does this make you feel? Okay. Gotta do this one first. 
Oh, Dara, so great to meet you. Welcome to the lab. Um, what year are you at Stanford? What are you majoring in? Uh, well, I'm a sophomore. I still haven't declared my major, but I'm, I'm thinking about human biology. Oh, human biology? Really? Um, isn't that just kind of like watered down biology? You really ought to consider biology. Um, you, but you've done the first year biology courses, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the HumBio core course right now. We're learning ecology, and yesterday we had this great lab session at Jasper Ridge. Oh, 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 ecology. You know, we don't, I, I didn't really learn much ecology when I was in college. We really do molecular biology here in this group. Mm. Um, but so let me tell you about what we're working on. So we're really interested in how these particular cells differentiate and become the basal lamina of the, um, of the organs as they're, as they're growing. And so we put these proteins on them, and then these receptors get them, and they make the cells grow. And mm. So have you done any cell work at all, any cell culture work? Um, yeah, we did some pipetting in BioLab last quarter, and I learned about cell culture from some of the articles that we had to read. Um, oh, OK. And I really enjoyed my experience with microscopes in my internship at Genentech last summer. Oh, oh, oh microscopes, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I do all the microscopy for this project. I, I really won't have time to teach you that, I don't think. Um, well, anyway, let me get started. So I have a bunch of solutions I want you to make. Um, I'll show you where all the stuff is. I've got to go to yoga, but then I'll be back this afternoon. Uh, okay, that'd be great. Can you tell me where to put my stuff? Okay. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so talk with your neighbor a little bit. What did you see, what did you hear, what did you feel during that interaction? I, it's a little exaggerated, but people have told me it's not that exaggerated, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, so. So talk amongst yourselves for a little, couple of minutes on this. What did you hear? Really? <laughs> I couldn't get to yoga. We had to get to yeah. What else? I was dismissive. Kind of like uh, we suggested that it was very like centered around the grad student and what the grad student's working on instead of like incorporating some of like new skill set to add variety to the research and maybe add like a new point of view. Just like, mm -hmm. oh, this is what we do. Like very opinionated. Like, oh, that's a stupid major. Because like we felt that all like watered down. Like all majors are kind. she interested in human biology? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, what different perspective does she bring to it? Yeah. It's very much about me. Yeah, what else? Yeah. I think that um, the grad student didn't really explain the research very well. It, she just went right into what they were doing instead of like giving the big picture. No big picture. Explaining right. what the lab is trying to do and then also explain then what will be her her task and how they, she will help the lab accomplish what they were going to do. So right. She, it didn't give like purpose. It didn't give any, any purpose. In fact, I got myself a little tangled up in a knot because I was talking about stuff that I have no idea what it meant. And so if there's anybody that works on basal lamina or any of that stuff, sorry. I didn't, I didn't really know what I was talking about. But yeah, there's no context, there's no big picture, there's no lead up to what the project is, no meaning to it at all, right? Well, about over here? Yeah, you, go ahead. Um, it seemed like the mentors didn't even care about the undergrad's experience. Um, he didn't take a personal interest in what she wanted to do. No, no, not really. Not really interested. <laughs> <laughs> My advisor just told me you've got to mentor this undergrad this summer. Does that does that happen here ever? That you all sort of all of a sudden get told that there's a student coming to the lab, but the professor's going to be gone all summer, and you're in charge of taking care of that person? It happens. Along the same thing, it seemed like it was more of a transaction rather than a relationship. Yes, very transactional, right. That's a really good way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, and one more. Uh, do you think of like other kind of like logistics things? Like, oh, you can you know, put your stuff down here, you can go to the bathroom down the hallway, um, <laughs> there are, you know, coffee machines down the right. hall too. Right, right, absolutely. Sort of like introducing her, like actually caring about making sure she feels like she's ready to. Right. Did you look ahead on the slides a little bit? <laughs> yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. All those little nice things make such a huge difference. Okay, so we're going to replay this now. So listen to our second version and tell us what you think. 
So, so great to meet you, Dara. Welcome to the lab. What year are you in at Stanford? What's your major? Well, I'm a sophomore and I still haven't declared my major, but I'm thinking about human biology. Hmm, human biology. You know, I've heard that's a really interesting major that gives you more flexibility than biology. Plus, you don't have to be with all those pre-meds. <laughs> but um, what makes you interested in it? What courses have you liked? Well, right now I'm in the HumBio core course, and we're learning ecology. And yesterday we had this great lab session at Jasper Ridge. I really like working outdoors and learning about how the animals and plants interact. Wow, that's great. You know, I never learned much ecology in college. I really focused on molecular biology. But it's great that you find it interesting. Maybe you can teach me some things. And it's so fun to do your research outside. But you know, the lab can be really fun, too. Um, so let's talk about what we're working on. Um, I need to dash out for a bit this afternoon, but I'll come back and work with you later on. But let me just give you a little bit of briefing. So have you ever wondered about how cancer metastasizes and how those cells kind of move through the body? You know, most of us have had somebody that suffered from cancer. And if not, if we haven't already, we will. So it's really interesting to learn what makes those cells decide to leave the tumor and migrate to different parts of the body and cause cancer in different places. So this is the big question we're interested in. I'll tell you some more details about the specific work we do later on. But, but that's just start pondering that and think about what that might mean. Just think about cancer cells in your body. So um, but tell me, uh, what makes you interested in this project? Well, we did some pipetting in BioLab last quarter quarter and I learned some about cell culture, um, but really I got really interested in biology during my internship at Genentech when I got a lot of experience using microscopes. Oh cool, oh great, so, so was Genentech a fun place to work? Oh yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah, I have some friends there, it's great. Yeah, Ooh. it's so great that you got to do that. Well, we use a lot of microscopy because we really like to look at the cell structure, so maybe we'll have time this summer to do some work in that. I'll try, I'll try to train you on that, that could be really helpful. But first, we got to do some inevitable grunt work. I've got a lot of solutions we need to make. I'm going to show you how to do this this afternoon. Okay. Um, and so we'll go through that a couple of times to make sure you know where everything is. Um, I've got to run off to yoga right now. But in the meantime, I want you to sit down and do the lab safety training that's required. You can do that while I'm gone. And then when I come back, um, we'll get started on things, OK? Oh, and by the way, I cleared off this desk. And you can leave your things there. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate how much you've welcomed me to the lab. Okay, so a little again, a little exaggerated maybe, but I just I want to point out that this wasn't that much longer. Okay, that that session was not that much longer. The first one was really quick and perfunctory. I think somebody said very transactional. This one I hope had more of that relationship building and the find. Thank you, Dara. Welcome to the lab. Um, I hope this had more of those those qualities that we really like. Um, but it really didn't take that much longer. It really didn't take that much longer. So what did you see? What was different? Yeah. Right. It doesn't take much to have a follow-up probing question when somebody tells you something, does it? What interests you in that? Had you had any experience with this? What courses have you liked? Why have you liked those courses? Now, it doesn't take much. It's really easy to dismiss somebody, isn't it, and just move on and not even, not even acknowledge what they said. What else was different? Yeah. Um, the experience Yeah. Right, something that she can use and it's not too crazy. And you can see that some of the things that the student said were a little, little juvenile, immature maybe, right? I mean, oh, we did some pipetting, whatever. I mean, you, oh, I used some software. It's sort of the analogy to that, like, oh, yeah, I've used Word, so therefore I knew, know how to use some really hardcore, you know, GIS software or something. But you just, just push it on that and, and just keep acknowledging that. Anything else on that that was very noticeable? OK, well, we're going to go through a little bit more on, on some of these things. I'm going to help you get started planning some things yourself. So, so starting off on the right foot, these are some questions for you to think about. What do you need to know about your mentee? Is your mentee a freshman or a senior doing an honors thesis? Is, um, is she someone who's um, coming into Stanford graduate program already or someone who maybe wants to apply to Stanford in the future? Is it a high school student? That's a whole different ballgame. So what do you need to know? What do you need to prepare? Space. We'll go through some of these things. What do they need to do to prepare? What does your mentee need to do? 
How much time do you need to carve out? I would say that mentoring is a time suck. It's not a time saver. Keep that in mind. So we talked about how you want data, you want progress, you want labor. You're not going to get labor right away. Trust me, it's going to take time. You need to carve that out. Um, I realized with my, the students that I worked with here when I've mentored students or we have students working in the VPG office, I have to put on my calendar when they're going to be in the office because otherwise I don't make time for them. I don't plan ahead. I don't think about what their progress is. So that's just a simple tip. If you have a mentor working 20 hours a week, know what those hours are and make sure they're on your calendar so you know and you're not always dashing off to yoga or to a seminar. And then what do you do if you're having a bad day? What do you do if you're tired? Do you remember when your high school science teacher would come in and maybe put a video on and say, hey, today we're going to watch a movie, OK? <laughs> Everybody, get your notebooks out, take notes, and you're going to write a summary for homework. What was that about? <laughs> I have a couple of, I, what? Hangover. hangover, absolutely. My husband used to be a science teacher. It is absolutely about a hangover. <laughs> it's also about, it's also about, I didn't sleep well. I have a cold. I, my, my father's sick. My kids were a pain in the butt this morning. It's about a whole bunch of stuff. What's your equivalent of the high school teacher's movie that you're going to put on? Read these articles. Um, what is it? So just think about that. OK, so these are a lot of the things that we, we, we cover. Some of these things we cover, we'll cover these in a little bit more detail now. What I'm going to give you now is a ton of information, and I apologize for that. I know it's violating all kinds of PowerPoint rules of having text-heavy slides. I'm sorry about that. Think of it more as a guide that you can refer to later, which is why we gave you the slides as a handout. Not all of what I'm going to show you is going to apply to you specifically. It might not apply to you now. It might not apply to your research project. It's up to you to then pick and choose what's going to make the most sense for you and to make your own plan. So that's what we're going to spend some time doing the next couple of minutes. Um, and that's why I asked you if you jumped ahead in the slides about where's the restroom, where's the coffee maker, all those types of things are really important. So I've given you this as a handout. This is your worksheet. Um, Vanessa has some pencils. If you need one, just raise your hand. And what we're going to do is I'm going to help you make your individualized plan right now. So as I go through these slides, and we're going to stop for a minute, and you're going to jot down some notes in each of these boxes that apply to your specific situation. Um, and if you don't have anything maybe right now where you're mentoring someone, think, think ahead about when you might be mentoring someone in the future. OK, so preparing. Um, what is the mentee's project? We'll talk more about that in a minute, about how to make a, a bite-sized kind of project. What, what about access to the building? Is your building locked all the time? Um, access to databases. Do they need to be able to get on a server? Do they need to have access to your website um, for editing purposes? Uh, where are they going to put their things? Where is their space? What training do they need? Articles to read? Safety, responsible conduct of research things. Um, human subjects. Anybody working with human subjects where you might need to Brief your mentee on your IRB protocols and all that stuff. I mean, think about all these things. What's the schedule? Do you start at 8 or do you roll in at 10 or 11? When do you want your mentee to be there? Are there clothing requirements? Somebody laughed at this one. They're like, what? And I said, think about it. You're working in a lab. You, you're, you can't have open-toed shoes. You're not supposed to. I know people do anyway. You're working out, out in the field somewhere doing some geological surveying. You need sun protection. You need a hat. You need boots. What if your research involves interviewing business people? Are you going to go like a typical undergrad with flip-flops and shorts and a spaghetti strap shirt? No. You might want to tell your mentee to dress in you know, a professional style. So take a look at these things. Take a few minutes on your worksheet now, which is I think that's the last page of your handout, and jot down some things in the preparing quadrant, OK? What applies to you? What's most relevant to you? And what am I missing? There may be other things that I'm missing. I'm sure there are things that I'm missing.
Okay, I see about half of you looking up, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. But you can finish this up later. Again, you've got the slides just as prompts to get you thinking about some things. Okay, so getting started. What does that first meeting look like? What does that first day look like? That first week look like? Um, be there to greet your mentee. Don't, don't have to run off to yoga right away. It's okay to go to yoga. Let me just say that. It's okay to have to go to yoga. It's actually a good thing to model work-life balance with people. Um, research doesn't have to be all about work. But when you do, if you are gonna run off to yoga, have something else for the mentee to do that's productive during that time. Um, introduce them around to people. Who who's, works in the office? Who else is in the research group? Who are they gonna meet coming into the building? Establish a schedule, a start and end time. Try to be inspiring and positive and optimistic. Love your job. Remember the high school student I mentioned from San Francisco. Love your job. That's really important. Schedule your check-ins. Are you the kind of person that likes to check in every morning and plan your day, or do you like to plan a week ahead? What's going to work best for your research, for your mentee, and how is this going to change over time, right? It's not going to be the same maybe in the whole, relation, whole time you have a relationship. How do you interact with your own advisor and mentor now? Uh, discuss the data management. Keep in mind that research is different than, than working. It's not and doing coursework, okay? What, what kind of data are you going to use? What's the norms within your field, within your discipline, in terms of data integrity, research integrity? And invite them to different events that are happening. Are there, are there seminars going on that they might be interested? Journal clubs, lab meetings, what else is going on that they might want to be a part of? So take just a minute to jot down some things in this getting started phase. What's important in your situation? Again, you're making your plan. Okay, so we'll go through the last two a little more quickly so that, and then you can follow up later on. So as the, the, um, the mentee-mentor relationship progresses, so it might be a summer, it might be a quarter, it might be a whole year, it might be an incoming graduate student rotating in your research group. I mean, there's all kinds of different things. It might be something that continues for much longer, but think about that time frame. Oftentimes it is bounded by something. And then think about um, how you're going to use that time. So if it's the summer, what does the first month look like, second month, third month? I use this telltale, show, show, watch, watch, watch thing just to remind you that um, a way, one way of teaching is to tell people what you're going to show them. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to make solutions right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the bounce. We're going to weigh these things out. And then we're going to mix them together and we're going to use this piece of equipment. First, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to show you and have you watch me do something. And then I'm going to watch you do something. And then maybe I'm going to let you go to do it on your own. The number of times that you have to tell, tell, show, show, watch, watch is dependent on what? It's dependent on what you're doing. It's dependent on how quickly your mentee picks up on it. It's dependent on how important the thing is. If this is the thing that's going to make or break your dissertation, I would urge you to tell, 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 show, show, show a lot before you actually let somebody go on these things. So, so that's really going to be up to you. Think about what deliverables you have. What are some deliverables that there might be? A lot of summer students at Stanford, what do they have to do at the end? They have to participate in a poster session, undergraduate poster session. You need to know that. What if it's an honors thesis? You need to know that. What if they just want something awesome to write about on their grad school application? So think about what are those deliverables. And what are the deliverables for you? Ask how they're doing. Reinforce that research integrity. Tie, continue to tie to the bigger goal. And then continue to add more challenging projects and opportunities if appropriate. And remember, attend to your own needs, OK? Don't get exhausted and frustrated and burned out on mentoring. OK, so take a few minutes to write down some notes on that, like a 30 seconds on that one, and then we'll move on to the last one.
Okay, I see some faces looking up. So let's move on to the wrapping up. So again, prepare in advance for those deliverables. Organize all the data and the notes and the notebook and the, the data sets and the software program, whatever it is that your mentee's been working on. Don't lose all that. Some of it might be really valuable. Um, ask about how you can help. Ask for, give feedback to your mentee and that feedback could be in the form of a letter of recommendation might just be in the form of a conversation that you have. Sometimes this may be the, the person's first job experience, so that's really important. Um, that you may have to do an evaluation for some other purpose, like if it's part of a course or an honors thesis, there may be some formal evaluation part of that. And then ask for feedback yourself. That can be really important for your own job application. So don't take these kinds of experiences lightly. Advising and mentoring are part of managing people. And having experience managing people is very often going to give you a leg up in a job application situation. So don't dismiss the importance of this. Put it on your, on your CV or your resume. Ask for feedback. Um, you may want to have their mentee, especially if you had a really good relationship with the mentee, have them talk to your advisor about how great you were so that your advisor knows that. Why? Because your advisor is going to be writing you letters of recommendation. And so can they incorporate? Wow, L last summer, Jose mentored this fantastic undergraduate and the student was so su successful and it was a beautiful relationship and you're wonderful. Hire this person. So don't, again, don't dismiss that. So a few, why don't, in this time, why don't you um, chat a little bit with your neighbor first about what might be important in your situation in this wrapping up? What are, what are some things that you would want to do as you're wrapping up a mentee-mentoring relationship? You can jot down some notes, but you can also just chat about it really quickly. Which of those are most important to you? Okay, so um, so I've given you a lot of information in this making a plan, the making a plan slides. I encourage you to continue to use this handout and continue to reflect on this. There is no one size fits all. Everybody's situation is different, and things are going to change as your relationship with your mentee develops too. So I think think of this as an ongoing planning tool. Okay, thanks. So. We, we, when we've gone through all this, we still really haven't talked about research, right? Which is one of the topics of this, of this uh, one of the key points of this presentation. So I want you to start thinking again. I have no idea what any of you do in terms of research, but I want you to start thinking about how do you articulate that for your mentee. So it could be it's in the conversation that you have when they first start, but very often you're actually actively recruiting someone. So how many of you have like recruited um, undergraduates, say, through like the undergraduate advising and research? So, there's, so a lot of times you're having to write a project and then students will apply for it. So it's a competitive process. So you want to think about how do you write that in a way that's engaging. So, and then how do you continue when you're working with someone to continue to reinforce that? So I, you, again, you have a handout on this. You can jot down some notes as I go through these. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. And this is just a structure really to help you. So what's the big goal of your research? Why do you care? Why do we care? Why does your mentee care? So in the example with Dara, I, the second time I tried to frame it with respect to metastatic cancer. 
so that this is something that she's going to get. She's going to know somebody. She's going to understand the importance of this. Okay, maybe you want to eliminate world hunger, you know, poverty, whatever. So what are those big things? And then what are the little goals? What do you actually do? None of us cure cancer or eliminate world poverty or world hunger, right? None of us do those big goals. We do a bunch of little things. So frame it to help frame that. And then what methods and data do you use? What are you building on? You know, I use ethnographic studies because I really want to understand deeply the experience that these leaders have. Um, I use cell biology or, you know, because I want to understand how these cells change over time. So articulate those, get into those more specifics. But then what's the bite-sized project that your mentee is going to do? How does this feel like a tangible, meaningful project for him or her? Um, and then continue, why is it super important for that big goal? Tie it back to that big goal. So this structure may not work for you. I think it's a reasonable structure to start thinking about these things. And I think this is also something that you can, you can draft some things. You can practice saying it. That's another really important thing. Practice talking about it so that you're not stumbling over it. And run it by somebody. Run it by your advisor. Run it by your colleagues. Run it by some, some friends and see if it makes sense. So you've got a handout for that on the other side of that one. So you can use that. OK, a lot of mentoring and managing people really comes down to communicating effectively. And we t we, some of you mentioned that, good communication skills. Um, you, I also gave you a, on your handout this um, effective communication. This is from the Center for Teaching and Learning. This is another one of these handouts. We use this in a, a lot of VPGE things. We actually use it in the VPGE staff meetings because to remind ourselves to be good listeners. Um, most people at a place like Stanford are pretty good talkers. Well, pretty good talkers, but we're not all good listeners. And so this handout can help you think about both the, how do you show that you're a good listener? What's your body language? What techniques do you use? You paraphrase what you, you don't always um, take it back to your own experience. And thinking about listening for understanding, tell me more about that. Can you say more? I'm not sure I got what you said. So ask probing questions that help you understand better what the person's trying to do trying to say, and, and be empathetic. And another thing to remember is you don't always want to be the problem solver. So sometimes people just want to talk and get it out there. Oh, you, it sounds like that was really frustrating for you. Did you have any, how did you feel when that happened? But not to come in and say, oh, you should have done this. When that happened to me, I did this and it worked really well. So that can really shut down the other person. So again, you're not always trying to solve problems. Sometimes you are. Again, this is another good thing. Put this up on a bulletin board somewhere and refer back to it. I think this will be really helpful for you. And then communicating effectively is also about knowing your own style. So are you a direct person? Do you always want to get to the point? Um, are you more guarded, more cautious, more um, not the quickest one in the room to speak up? How do you behave in your research group meetings or in your courses? That's one way you can sort of assess where you are. No right or wrong answers here, but knowing your own style can be really helpful. Knowing your work style. So Monday mornings, I like to come into the office, put my door halfway closed, get my cup of tea, and just get into it, just hammer through some work. I just got to get stuff done, the stuff that didn't get done the week before, the stuff that kept me up over the weekend. Don't bother me then. My, my door is half closed. If you really need me, I'm there. But that's my time. I know that about myself. I don't want to talk to people necessarily. I don't want a lot of meetings. I just want to work. So knowing your own style. Friday afternoon, I'm happy to chat and just shoot the, shoot the bull as much as you want. But, so know your own style is really important and sharing that with your mentee. And then what's your personal style? How much personal stuff do you want to share? You don't have to share personal stuff. What's, what, what do you want to share? How do you want to interact with that person? Now, we're not going to go deeply. And this is something you could spend a lot of time on. Some actions that you can take. Go to your career center. How many of you have never visited the career center? Ooh. I promise me that you will visit your career center over the summer if you're here. And if not, certainly by the end of fall quarter. They have some fantastic resources. A lot of great self-assessments that help you learn about yourself. And also counseling sessions that can help with that. Take another one of our workshops in depth to learn more about yourself. Leadership Labs is being taught as part of SGSI in September, if you're interested in that. Ask a friend or a classmate or a research group mate, how, how, did, I, how did I come across in that lab meeting? Was I too aggressive in my questions? 
Or was I too tentative in my questions? How did I take feedback in that meeting? Was I too defensive? Did I get defensive when the professor started asking me questions, or was I open to it? So ask for that kind of feedback for change and continuation. And then learn from what your advisor does well and not so well, okay? And change your own behavior accordingly. Those are just some, some strategies. Another thing um, that I want to say, there, this, this self-direction versus um, direction scale is really important. So hopefully you're somewhere in the middle of this with working with your mentee. You might be more on the micromanager side in the beginning. You probably want to be. You never want to get all the way to the sink or swim, but you probably want to be moving along this scale. This is probably what you've experienced with your own advisor, right? Hopefully none of you have been left to sink or swim, although we know that that does happen and hopefully none of you are being micromanaged, but hopefully you find a nice place on here with your own advisor. So think about this. When is the time you might micromanage? Working with radioactive material, for example. Working with samples that are limited. This is all you've got. Don't move too far that way. Working with a data set that was really expensive and you don't want it, it to be messed up by the person. Okay, so think about that. And again, reiterating that telltale show, think about where you are, and the context really matters. I want to point out this, this article from Nature, The Guide to Mentors. It's freely available, of course, because you have a Stanford um, subscription to Nature. It's a really nice article. Lots of great ideas and inspirational things in there for you, so I encourage you to check that out. Okay, so we have a few more minutes, and I want us to do some case studies together. Um, and we'll probably just do a few of them since we, we're running out of time. But, this is a situation where I want you to think about what you, what you might have done to avoid this situation and what you would do now that it's happened, okay? So a situation, the mentees and the grad, a, a new um, grad student, she's working with cell cultures, and as the mentor, I showed her how to do it, uh, but then one of the postdocs yelled at her and told her that, he, that she contaminated all of his work. Um, he was really mad. She was crying and she wants to quit. Um, you know what, but if she did mess up his work, then I know why he was mad, right? Um, so maybe I'm better off and just, just let her quit, you know, so the rotation's almost done. Um, and that postdoc was going to help me out, so I'm probably better off just letting her go, right? How could you have avoided this? What are your thoughts about this one? showed and watched more, made sure she didn't have the opportunity to mess up somebody else's work. Remember, you, many of you are in research groups where we got some strong personalities in there, and a lot of times, yeah. Go ahead. Right. Right. So helping her understand you know, what's hands off and why. Uh, making sure that the, I think also making sure the postdoc, the postdoc probably has some responsibility here, right? Maybe, maybe not, we don't know that much information, but, but maybe the postdoc could have been more careful about where he left his things and that his things weren't vulnerable to her. So what would you do now? Is this right? Should, should, should I just let her go? No? I need to take responsibility for it, right? I need to try to manage this interaction now. I need to try to console the postdoc and also make sure that he, that, that kind of behavior, which sounds pretty harsh, is not appropriate, right? So this is a time when you've got to manage up, you've got to manage the postdoc's response, and you've got to try to figure out what to do about the, the mentee. So um, hopefully this kind of situation doesn't happen, but if it does happen, don't abandon. Don't abandon your mentee. Um, I'm going to do, this is actually a good one since we were talking about hangovers recently. So um, this is a case where you, I was working with an undergraduate, we were in Mexico, you know, we were drinking in the, in the local cafes a lot because we were studying some things about youth culture in Mexico and so it was kind of part of our research, we were just having a good time. But now we're back on campus and, um, you know, my mentee got really drunk at our lab barbecue and my advisor was really, really mad at me. So what happened here? What did I do wrong? I think it also, it, it all depends on the age of the undergrad. If they're drinking in Mexico, it's probably the age. Right, it does depend on the age. <laughs> it's 21, so if he's a senior, then it, it should be OK. Like maybe the advisor was just like, well, you know, they should know better. But 
right? So, so this, is a, this is a case sometimes where sometimes this happens where you know, things happen off campus that are different than what would happen on campus. I think some of you have been at conferences or maybe retreats where there's some behavior that might not be appropriate on campus. But what is appropriate on campus should also apply off campus, okay? So you need to think about that. I'm not saying it's wrong to go and drink with your undergrad mentee in Mexico, but you need to think about that and what are the implications when you come back on campus. Is the person an underage? In this context, how do you manage that and how do you avoid this kind of, this is more of an embarrassing situation. But again, there's that responsibility there, um, both within the research and, and outside of the research. Um, we'll skip that one really quick. Okay, so here's another important one. So you've been working with a mentee, Kylie, and she's been doing great. Um, all of a sudden, she kind of withdraws and she's not as talkative and not as engaged in the research. You don't really know that much that's going on with her. You don't know that much about her, maybe, personally. But you're a little concerned, you know? But then you realize, like, your advisor never asks you what's going on and why, you're, why you, you know, might be grumpy or unhappy. So what would you do here? What would you do here? I don't know if you could have avoided this, because it sounds like it wasn't anything you did. But as a mentor, what's your role here? Any ideas? Yeah. Ask, ask, show concern. Make sure the opportunity is there for discussion, right? So maybe it's stepping away from the, the research environment, going out for coffee, taking a walk. Yeah. Right, right. Right. One of the things that, um, as a as a mother of teenage boys who sort of go silent for some years, you know, with you. One of the things that we always share with each other is that when you're driving and they're sitting next to you in the car is sometimes the best conversations that you have with them. And a couple of reasons. One is because they're kind of a captive audience. They can't just jump out of the car. But the other one is because you're not facing each other. You're not facing each other. You're facing ahead. And it's not confrontational and it's not in their face, literally and you're more likely to have a good conversation. So how do you do that? You don't have to get in a car. You walk. Take a walk and talk. It can, it can totally change the dynamic. So just think about that. And think about that if you ever have teenage boys, too. That's useful. <laughs> but one of the things I really put this up here for is you are not responsible for people's mental health. But you, if you are concerned about someone, there are always places to refer to. CAPS, of course. You can talk to your advisor. If the person's living in the dorm, there's resident directors in there. So do not be dismissive of somebody who seems off or seems to have changed their behavior. You are a first responder in that, but you don't have to, you don't have to counsel the person. You're not trained to counsel the person. But know that if that initial conversation happens and you're even more concerned about someone, take action. Okay, your instincts are good. And this goes with your peers as well, yeah. It could be inside or outside of work, right? You don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's tried to have that conversation so you can suss out, is it something that's happening because of work or something that's happening outside, and how are those interacting, and what can you control? You can't control a lot of the outside things, right? But maybe some of those inside things you can change. And it's, it's hard. It takes a while to learn how to read people, definitely. Okay, so we're going to wrap up now. Um, again, there's some next steps. You've got some handouts and some slides to continue working with, prepare and plan ahead. Check out the mentoring resources that I'll um, put up at the end, and we'll put these up on the Quick Bytes Toolkit site. Um, use the career centers. They're, your, they're here to help you. Oops, sorry. And remember, you don't want to be the tormentor. You want to be the mentor, OK? So good luck with that. Um, remember all of these things. And then here are some great mentoring resources if you want to go deeper in this, OK? So thank you. And VPGE is here to help you, too, especially if you're around in the summer and you just want to chat with someone about some things. We're here. OK, thanks.
And I'm here if you have any questions.